Max Kaiser, this is the Kaiser Report, the show that keeps it real. Stacey. So we're going to continue with the theme of the markets and, um, you know, following up on that correlation equals causation with all the big banks going down to the New York Fed right down here nearby our studio here in downtown New York City and uh, basically doing better than all other banks because they have insider information. Well, we're going to talk about the cotillion effect. Um, this is a cool tweet I saw last week from a Wall Street dropout. One of two, a cantillion effect, newly created money is not distributed evenly, simultaneously in a population. It has a specific injection point and flow through the economy. The first recipients are able to spend it before prices go up. The last recipients get hit with this hidden tax. Equities are near all time highs, but populist movements spring up globally around the same time Bitcoin is born. These are not coincidences. And I want to show you some charts that he provides as well. And this is the rising assets of the central banks, the top one being uh, the United States Federal Reserve. And then you have the uh, Bank of Japan and the ECB. In the United States, most of the equity markets, most of the stock markets are held by the top 20% and most of that by the top 10% and then even more by the top 1%. And you see, this is the Fed's balance sheet with the S&P 500. So they go up in lockstep and those closest to the money, those closest to the Fed, those who get to go and meet Fed executives and bureaucrats at two in the morning, well, they seem to benefit the most. Upstream, downstream. You know, in the ancient world, if you lived upstream, you had it better off, didn't you? Because all the, all the garbage and everything flows downstream. And uh, yeah. in the financial world, if you live in proximity to where the money's being printed, the cotillion effect uh, is meaning that you get first use of that money and uh, it then compounds at a rate unique to you. You get a compounded rate of return based on first use and time is on your side. If you're downstream, time is working against you because you end up with a savings account paying 0% or you have uh, no wages, or you're behind the inflation curve, and so you uh, negative compounded rate of return and the wealth and income gap divide. So people believe that something intangible like money could be easily distributed without much friction in the economy. But uh, of course, that precludes the presence of opportunists and rentiers and corrupt government officials that would maximize their own aggrandizement based on proximity to the printing of this fiat money. I mean, it's quite important to understand this because everybody looks around at this economy and they're all distressed about why the peasants out in the middle of America have voted for somebody like Trump and why they are listening to populist messages and, and we must do something about it. And well, let's shut down Facebook. Let's such, shut down Twitter. Let's keep them from communicating with each other. And what they're really, um, on what they're really feeling and why this populist uprising is happening and perhaps it's not articulated as such but this cantillion effect where they're getting all the the sludgy money at the end of gone through the stream of billionaires and bankers and hedge funds and private equity and all sorts of connected guys and lobbyists and all sorts of you know horrible people. <laughs> yeah, funny gets... word that word quintillion because it, it describes this financial event. It also describes uh, coming out parties yeah. for uh, privileged uh, society girls, a cotillion. Mm. Uh, you know, I don't think it's too close to it. Depends not, on how you pronounce right, it. Right, the spelling <laughs> is uh, different and it's not. It's similar though. <laughs> yes. So it's a bunch of wasps out there in Westchester County having cotillions, getting the quintillion effect. Uh, all financed, I guess. Big word starting with Q is what separates the upper and lower classes in America. Well, actually, cantillion starts with C. It's a freaking C. <laughs> it's a C. One's a C. One's a Q. You put those together, and you're in Britain, and you have a lawyer. The Queen's well, Council, the Queen's Constable, sorry. The QC, yes. The QC, the Queen's Consort. Well, let's move on to the next step here in the, our headlines because we're juxtaposing these two headlines. We're talking about the cantillion effect. We showed you the chart of the S&P 500 rising exactly with the Fed balance sheet and all of these guys running around New York City and Washington DC and San Francisco and Los Angeles who get access to this money first. They, they lord it over everybody else ask, acting like they, is they are, that are so genius, that know how to play the market, that are just so clever and they deserve this vast wealth and all the people at the bottom getting the dregs 
of their money after it's been polluted by all the. Well, it's like it, drug dealing, you know. You get the pure cocaine yes, from Colombia, and then you the uh, yeah. you cut it with yeah. uh, you know whatever Bacon powder. But so let's talk about the bottom. Of, uh, once people get the polluted money. People have stopped paying their mobile home loans, and it's a warning sign for the economy. The delinquency rate on mobile home loans has increased by 200 basis points or two percentage points over the past year, according to research cited by UBS. The 30-day delinquency level is now above 5%, the highest level since 2005. The increase in the number of struggling mobile home borrowers suggests that a large chunk of these people have not benefited from the economic growth of the past few years, despite the low unemployment level. So remember, economic growth, UBS is saying, happened, and these people have not benefited. But what that chart showed was just there was just money growth that went to a few people at the top. Go back to the financial crisis of 2008. You know, a lot of people lost their homes because of the mismanagement of the economy by the banks in the subprime crisis, where the creditors of the banks were bailed out and the debtors. Uh, were left to foot the bill. This is the first time in history this has ever happened. A lot of those people ended up in mobile homes, and a lot of people ended up in subpar housing, which incidentally was snapped up and bought out by private equity groups on Wall Street, financed by the super cheap cotillion effect money from the Federal Reserve Bank. Now, here we are eight, nine years later, and those folks can't hold on to their properties anymore because of the cotillion effect. The value of money has debased, been debased, and they are experiencing loss of quality of life and an own uh, loss of purchasing power, and now they're going to be booted out again. So they lost their home twice, once because of Wall Street management and twice because of Wall Street mismanagement. And of course, it's the groups like uh, Blackstone, which own a lot of the private homes, that they were able to access their relationships with the Fed and the Treasury to get uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac sort of big deals on uh, buying a vast amounts of property that were defaulted on and, uh, you know, foreclosed homes. But on, in this mobile home market, you have Warren Buffett is one of the largest, if not the largest owner of mobile homes in America. And uh, you have the, um, the hurricanes, the huge amount of hurricanes this past year, Harvey, Irma, Maria. So a lot of people have lost their mobile homes. And at the same time, the economy has been so bad and, and um, property markets out of control in places like New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, that a lot of middle class people are competing with these uh, the working class people to buy these mobile homes, which can only manufacture so many. So there is a like a complex situation happening here. Look, Warren Buffett's an interesting case because he's completely hedged because of his relationship and ownership of insurance companies and insurance products producing entities, he can be completely hedged against those hurricanes and hedged against all natural disasters and all financial disasters. And so he's not actually taking economic risk. Those people who are buying these mobile homes because they've been victimized by Blackstone and other Wall Street predators have no hedging available to them. So America is basically a hedged and unhedged country. Uh, that's the way to divide the population. There's a few people that are completely hedged. They keep every dollar that is generated without any risk. It's a riskless return of assets for them. And everyone else is basically taking all the risk and uh, they can't possibly compete. Well, they can't compete with that. You know, the fact is that the Fed only looks at the S&P 500 or other um, stock indexes. They only look at that, and lo and behold, those indexes look exactly like them. They're looking in the mirror. This is like they keep printing money to keep that up. They're not looking down there. And they should be like, oh, 5% of these people are defaulting. Let's print the money to bail them out. Instead, they're just bailing out these people at the top by the time. And, and they're hoping that more and more of their dirty, like polluted money trickles down to them, but it, it doesn't. And th here's the polite way UBS describes the situation. Oh, let's hear it. We interpret this data to mean that these individuals have not largely benefited from these macro dynamics and may also be disproportionately exposed to industries that have experienced compression rather than expansion in the current economic conditions, such as retail or some areas of energy extraction. So this is uh, financial speak and bank speak gobbledygook for communicating to the herd that they have successfully disenfranchised an entire generation and now they're patting themselves on the back and taking a victory lap and uh, it's very close to in previous societies we've seen the celebration of extermination of well, parts of the population. Uh, yeah that's a little bit over the top but what is simple one could say is UBS 
husband in many um, moments of possibly being arrested or fined many large amounts of money from the Fed that caused the S&P to uh, issue all this free money, clean money, to the likes of UBS that then trickles down. Yeah, so why, why are they issuing all this money? UBS is certainly not going to say anything to the Treasury about the Treasury or the Fed because, of course, they uh, want to make sure they get out of, je get out of jail. They're trying to rationalize all the money that they got received for free to bail themselves out and the fact that it caused economic dislocation. They're characterizing in this rather obtuse, long paragraph, long-winded uh, well, they are uh, they are identifying a genuine situation, which is the bottom are poor and they, <laughs> the bottom cannot pay even their mobile home loans. Of course, they cannot say it's you, the Fed, that bailed us out. It's you, the Treasury and the Department of Justice that allowed us to get away with this. They can't say that because why would they? Because they're just going to be like targeted the next go round, the next crash as we're experiencing. That's a, let me have that. I want to keep a copy of that. <laughs> no, I'll give later. it to you. That's a classic, classic Quickly, obfuscation. Uh, Quickly, I'll also tell you about another headline, and this is the similar case in South Korea, and that South Korean millennials are reeling from the Bitcoin bust. The country of around 52 million comprises 17% of all Ethereum trading. It's one of the top um, cryptocurrency markets, especially from last summer until the end of the year. So a lot of uh, Koreans piled in to cryptocurrencies at the top. But the thing that stood out about this article in the last minute here is uh, one thing they say about Americans and all of these unemployed Americans is that we don't have the right educated population. We need to bring in these immigrants. And if people just had the right uh, qualifications, maybe the economy would be better. But this a bit stood out to me about the millennials in South Korea who are have a high unemployment rate. Their incomes are declining. They're worse than their parents' generation. In this highly educated economy, it could be hard hard for young Koreans to distinguish themselves from their peers. Nearly 70% of all Koreans aged 25 to 34 have a post-secondary degree, the highest of all OECD countries. So they're already way highly educated, and that's what they answer the sorts like MSNBC will say, well, we just need to educate all these people in Kansas and Missouri and, and coal country and places like that, and we'll just be fine. But here in, North, in South Korea, 70% of them have a a college degree or higher, so they're unemployed still. Well, it's not about education, it's about common sense. Read your Mark Twain. It's actually about the cantillion effect. Well, speaking of debutantes, debutante balls, and all things swishy, stay tuned for the second half right after this break. Прекрасный сон, он всегда был рядом со мной. Когда в себя делаешь полный глоток воздуха, начинаешь выходить за пределы атмосферы, видишь землю, плывешь, плывешь, плывешь. Хочется опять отдохнуть, оттолкнуться и полететь. Больше 11 лет, период, когда я был по медицинским показателям, не годен. Но не сломался, не сдался, убедил в том, что я готов. Когда я решился на полет, и для семьи был маленький шок, никто этого не ожидал. Расставаться тяжело на самом деле. К этому нельзя привыкнуть. Нет. Каждый раз думаешь, дайте силы пережить. Чем старше становлюсь, тем страшнее становится. Понимаю, что человек, если что-то произойдет, он, в принципе, ничего не сможет там сделать. путешествие тоже для своих, в том числе потому, что мне надо каждый раз доказывать и своей супруге, что я мужчина, настоящий мужчина, что я еще готов и могу сделать безумные поступки. Oh, hi. 
Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. That buzzing is nothing. Don't pay any attention. Well, anyway, uh, let's continue now with our conversation with Valentina Lasitza. Welcome back. Hey, okay, back. as I mentioned, it's a great privilege to have an artist of your caliber on this show. Now, when I see you on YouTube and I see you attacking those pieces and you're ripping through Beethoven and you're annihilating Bach, and I'm thinking, you know, the, the what, how do you, uh, do you, are you conscious? When you're playing, or are you just like unconscious? How do you do that? It's the same as with any outlet. You get into a zone, and you're totally not there, and hopefully you take your audience with you, and we go to different dimensions. You know, we are, we're not creators. Composers are creators, we're performers, but you use all of your life experience, everything emotionally, what you live through, vicariously or yourself, to pour, basically, I know it's high words, to pour your soul out. To but people. you have a story now. I have many stories. Yeah, but your story, your personal story, is now reflected in your performance. To s Do you feel more actuated? I think it was a young or Freud, the process of self-actualization, mm -hmm. where you be become yourself, so to speak. You achieve your the highest order of your own self-awareness. You lose fear, yes, and then you are able to speak your soul out. That's the most important thing, because if you have inner fear or reservation of something, then you cannot connect with people. It's so let's get back to this whole political thing. So when you're confronted with a political um, kind of backlash, as to stay fearless, you must be true to your fearlessness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was very tempting, you know, to back off. And a lot of people told me, whether kindly or not so kindly, you'd better shut up and do your stuff, play. And then I remember even in Soviet Union, you know, with all the censorship, you know, Shostakovich is one of my absolutely favorite composers and human beings. He was censored when he actually, he stopped writing anything with words because the words, you know, like operas or songs, they would be analyzed and considered to be political. So he wrote pure music in which all the people who came there, they could perfectly understand what he said. So inner censorship was not there. You said something recently, um, which I remember uh, took note of, that um, the, the notes are basically just, um, you know, uh, specs on the page. We have no record of how they should be played. Mm -hmm. They're all written before uh, the, the technology mm -hmm. to capture these performances. Uh, so we don't really know uh, what the composer had in mind beyond his ability to uh, make notations, you know, so speed it up a little slower, you know, allegro, mm -hmm. whatever. These we put ourselves into the music. We put ourselves in context, both as performer, like I am, and listeners. Because, for example, you know, to put it simply, if person heard some song at his or her wedding and it's associated with something happy, when whenever this person listens to the same piece, he remembers the same nice feeling. But if it was heard at funeral, it's different. But it would be the same piece, right? So we all put our own meaning, our own life experience, our own history into very much classical musical pieces. You know, why, why do we still listen to Beethoven or Bach? You know, those are classical composers. We have marble busts of them. They were wearing wigs, but they still speak to us for some reason. It's because we put ourselves into those specks of black ink on white paper. You are a priest to some degree, um, you know, interpreting the words That's of, right. uh, of the, the deities. Yes, uh, of, the, of, cre of the creators. The creators, and you are, and you to the pulpit, and you tell the congregation essentially that you, this is what is ha this is the word spoken, and and your the response by the public has been you know enormous. You're the most viewed classical pianist on YouTube ever by a huge margin, and um, you also have become politically uh, involved and in the in the. Uh, kind of uh, the subject of political uh, debate, if you will, because you happen to be born Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. I mean, that just happened to be your, 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 your country of origin. Yes, and the pressure was on me as a public figure to speak out. You know, it's not like I started doing it out of blue. 
You know, the first thing that happened, I was given an interview for a style section in Italian newspaper. And, you know, we were going through long things, you know, what dresses you wear, so on. And that was around, just around Maidan. And then the person asked me, the interviewer, but what do you think about Maidan? I said what I think about Maidan. And then I didn't see the interview. And then some fan of mine writes to me, so Valentina, tell me honestly, do you think of all of us Russians that were vampires? I say, what? What did I say? And she sends me, she lives in Italy, a Russian person. She sends the headline says that Putin is a vampire who came to our country. They literally take the words and put them in my mouth and make a headline out of it. Because I'm Ukrainian, it was convenient. So at that point, I started on Twitter delivering, basically translating the news, what was happening, and things were going downhill. You know, like many Ukrainians, I was excited about Maidan, you know, because revolution, especially when it's televised, and all, you know, people unite as one, and there is this feeling that some good things will come out. It's always uplifting, and you want to be part of it. And then you see things that come out during Maidan, you know, sh shooting, killings, what, ha what was happening after. And then you, like many people, become shocked by it. And I, what I saw in the media, in mainstream media, was not corresponding to what I saw. So I started translating things from Russian and Ukrainian to my English. At that point, it was only English-speaking audience. You know, I didn't have any connections to Russia or anything. And then I was put, put on notice, so people told me to shut up. And I'm a very stubborn person, and I live on adversity. I thrive on adversity. So when I'm told to shut up, I open my mouth twice as wide. <laughs> Not a smart thing, but, you know. You see, if you were playing um, a lot more simpler music, uh, you know, like rock music or something, mm -hmm. you, you could be marginalized a lot easier. But because you're interpreting the greatest music ever written and doing it brilliantly, it's really hard to dismiss you. But I also have millions of following around the globe. Young kids, not so young kids, adults, elderly well, as people. As a Ukrainian, I, I want to ask a question, you know. I mean, I, I'm not an expert on these topics, obviously, as someone who was born in Ukraine. But um, when you heard the voice of Victoria Nuland, the Assistant Secretary of State, on the phone, talking to folks in Europe about orchestrating a coup in Ukraine on behalf of NATO mm -hmm. so that they could protect the interests of Monsanto, her husband's lobbyist group, and an obvious push east to repudiate everything that was negotiated with Reagan under the Cold War I that ended the Cold War. Just a complete kick in the teeth to the peace process, a kick in the teeth to uh, anyone who seeks to have a, a more peaceful future. How did that make you feel? Very sad, very upset, but at the same time, you have to understand that majority of people truly believe the West is out there to help us. You know, it's always in the beginning, and only later you understand that the, these people, they have actually some other motives, you know, to rob you later, to take over your possessions. You know, the countries which didn't have many revolutions or civil wars, they are doing the best. You know, take Switzerland, which, the country which is absolutely should be model for Ukraine because it's multi lingual, so people sing their anthem in different languages, they decide everything by referendum, it's direct democracy, it's an exemplary country for Ukraine to follow. Instead, it follows different model which is brought in by NATO, yes, there is a coup, yes, the government brought was- Brought in by what? By, by coup. Yes. Like who? Yeah, yes, it's absolutely, it's not democratic change. And people are used, all these million of peop, millions of people who went on Maidan to protest on popular government because they love to be on TV, frankly, you know, they were encouraged. They became statists in this coup. And meanwhile, uh, Mohammed bin Salman uh, from uh, Saudi Arabia, who's, you know, they're openly slaughtering Yemeni's children, he's, he's considered to be a freaking hero. It's a double standard. It's double standard all over the place. You know, we encourage the worst in humanity as long as they're on our side. Just to, to help me understand, so when I, when after Maidan, during Maidan, uh, then the, the allegedly uh, this group, uh, Azov Brigade, is, uh, has obtained ministerial positions in Ukraine, mm -hmm. allegedly, uh, they have ties to neo-Nazi parties. It, it, w is that a fair statement? What's going on there? You know, again, the question of double standards. If something happens in Charlottesville, there are Nazis, everybody screams, oh, you know, hold all Trump electors are Nazis, right? 
and they don't say alleged or anything. But when things happen in Ukraine, and you know, Azov, right sector, Svoboda Party, there are millions of those things. But people say, oh, you know, but support is really too small. They get 5% at elections. And also, you know, they're not really, you're not allowed to say. But for me, you know, if it walks as a duck, and these people walk, you know, with their hand up in the air. If it talks like a duck, and these people talk about other nation, other ethnicities other than Ukrainian being subhuman, that they need to kill them, to get rid of them, they attack Russian, they attack, they are anti-Semitic, they attack Polish people, they attack Hungarian people. So it talks like a duck. It's, you know, substitute duck for N-word. For yeah, no, you know, uh, and, and <laughs> so the, US, the U.S. is fully on board. Yes. Which yeah. is disgusting. U.S. envoy to Ukraine, Kurt Walker, says to other countries, oh, please let off the criticism of Ukraine because they need to build this. They go through this nationalism, but it's like teenager years. They will overgrow it. I got to tell you that I'm very impressed. You know, again, great having you on the show. So uh, to give you a little the background, of course, you, you were um, not allowed to perform in Toronto uh, after being invited there, you know, for political reasons, basically. And um, my understanding is then you follow that up with a, with a concert in Donbass. Yeah, I was invited to Donbass after. I became notorious. So you have to get in. This is in Ukraine. You have to go in there through Soviet Union, behind the front line. <laughs> Soviet Union. Behind, We're still in Cold War. Behind yes. the Soviet Union. Yes. The lines, you go from Russian okay. side. And this was like my first well, trip. Well, I'm, I'm speaking as like Victoria Newland now. Yes. I'm channeling Victoria Newland. You had to go through the Soviet Union. You had to tunnel your way through the, the, the wreckage and the detritus of, of a communist collapse to get to Donbass. And bread lines. And bread lines. And empty shells. And, and, and then <laughs> you performed your wicked classical music. Yes, I'm, I'm aiding and abating terrorists because I'm on Ukrainian security services blacklist. They have like kill list called Miratvori, the peacemaker, and they killed quite a few people from there. So I cannot go to see my family. I cannot go to, you know, we would call it mainland Ukraine because I would be arrested immediately as Ukrainian citizen. So I can only go on other side in Donbass. And when I played there, I played the same Rachmaninov Second Concerto. There were 15,000 people there, and you could still hear the bombs dropping at that point. And these people, you know, for I gotta cut it off there because oh. we're out of Time, but thank you so much for being on the show. Rarely do we have someone with your guts. You got guts. Unlike all these other and fingers. Right on. Well, uh, if you want to catch the uh, other side of the story about Azov Brigade, please uh, check out the glowing profile in the Guardian newspaper over there in the UK. And that's going to do it for us here on the Kaiser Report. I'd like to thank our special guest, Valentina Lasitza. And if you want to catch us on Twitter, it's Kaiser Report. Until next time, bye, y'all.